Thank you. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Amy Corman. Amy's a horticulture extension educator at Penn State Extension based in Northampton and Lehigh Counties, Pennsylvania. Dr. Corman develops programming for landscaping professionals and her responsibilities include providing research-based solutions to landscape problems such as weeds, pests, and diseases. Dr. Corman supports the Master Gardener Training Network and the Vector Borne Disease Team. Amy holds an MS degree from North Dakota State University and a PhD from Louisiana State University in entomology. Please welcome Dr. Corman. Good morning, thanks for having me. I was really impressed uh, with what uh, you talked about your first hour. That's quite a, quite a significant amount of effort uh, in, in addressing invasive species. And so I've learned a lot, so thank you. Um, if I can uh, have the opportunity to share my screen, please. You should be able to do it now. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, and if that looks good for y'all, I'll just proceed. Looks good. Okay, thank you. So um, as we uh, discussed about what sort of presentation uh, this would be this morning, we talked about developing strategies for um, spotted lanternfly, uh, dealing with this invasive species. I, I don't like to say control because I don't think we're there yet. Um, and, and so I have designed this specifically to kind of do a review of spotted lanternfly in general, and then talk about some management type um, strategies. And I left a lot of time because there's usually a lot of questions. So with that, um, let me just proceed. Uh, this is not um, uh, a plug for Penn State Extension work, uh, but I do want to let everyone know that all of our materials are available to the public. And more importantly, we have been updating um, modifying and sharing our resources with the public when things change. For instance, the spotted lanternfly management guide on the left used to be a really short um, fact sheet. And it's now a 17 page long guide of all the basic stuff about spotted lanternfly that we've learned in the past couple of years. And so that's available to download or, or to order through our uh, publication center. So we are trying to really keep whatever publications that we have on the net updated uh, as rapidly as possible. So for those of you who are not really familiar with the spotted lanternfly, let me just give you the breakdown. Right now, for most places, the spotted lanternfly is simply in its egg form. That's its overwintering stage. We see eggs being deposited sometime towards the end of September and um, spotted lanternflies may stay in that egg stage until June. But uh, somewhere around the end of April, beginning of May, and it depends upon where you are uh, and the number of growing degrees that have passed, but spotted lanternflies start to emerge. And this hatch period uh, they don't all emerge at once, but they will emerge over the course of um, several weeks in any particular area. Again, depending upon um, how many growing degrees are being accumulated. And this first hatch may uh, continue through June. And then uh, there are three more nymphal instar stages uh, that progress throughout the summer until the end of July, the beginning of August, when we start to see adults showing up. Adults will show up, their behaviors change, they move around. Um, we see big bouts of flight sometime later in September. And towards the end of September through December or when the hard frosts kill the adult population, they will be ovipositing egg masks. So here's where spotted lanternfly gets really interesting. During these first um, three instar stages, the little black and white ones, they are primarily um, feeding on 
Herbaceous plants, we see them on a number of things. It, there have been over 70 different host plants, I say that in quotes, recorded for spotted lanternfly. We've seen them feed on basil, on cucumbers, on horseradish, and blueberry roses, and a number of other things. But in this um, first couple of stages of its development, uh, it moves around a lot, and it's really an opportunistic feeder. What's it close to that's going to taste good, and what's it going to eat? And so by the time that um, the fourth instar shows up, and that's the nymphal stage that is mostly red with white and black spots on it. Now the spotted lanternfly tends to lean to woodier hosts. This is where we're seeing it more on trees. And <clears throat> so this is the current distribution in Pennsylvania, the little orange, little yellow spot on my screen is where the spotted lanternfly infestation was first identified in Pennsylvania and in a few counties in Berks, um, a few townships in Berks County. Um, and you can see it's since spread to more than half the state of Pennsylvania. Um, but more importantly, here is the current spotted lanternfly reported distribution. This was just updated two days ago. Uh, and you can see that it's now in, um, in addition to New York, but it's in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana. Um, and I think I got everybody there. So we're, we're in a total of 11 states now. And the reason why I spotted Landerfly got to all these places is because it is a great hitchhiker and we've carried it there. So let's talk a little bit about impact because that, that can be quite significant. So this is a, um, a, a grape planting that didn't do so well with uh, spotted lanternflies hanging around in here. And the bottom line for all these words on this screen is number one, there have been recorded yield losses associated with spotted lanternfly. And secondly, for vineyards, there are increased costs associated with spotted lanternfly infestations because they are applying more pesticides in order to kill spotted lanternflies. Um, so there is a big impact uh, to vineyards. But what about spotted lanternfly in trees? Remember, spotted lanternfly feeds on over 70 different types of host plants. For trees, it really likes tree of heaven, which we know is an invasive species in its own right. Um, but it doesn't have to feed on tree of heaven in order to reproduce. It also likes black walnut. It also likes um, red and silver maple trees. Um, it likes willow. It likes river birch. So it really likes a lot of different host plants that are readily available in this area. That's one of the challenges with dealing uh, with this insect because um, it, it does have this really broad host range. So what happens when spotted lantern flies are feeding on trees? Well, you can see willowing and yellowing of branches or you get some dead branches. Um, uh, when you have thousands of spotted lantern flies feeding on a tree, you see these wounds where they've shoved their mouth parts into it, especially the adults, because they have nice big mouth parts to, in order to shove through the trunk of the tree. Um, these weeping wounds will attract bees, ants, and wasps, as well as the honeydew that the spotted lanternflies are producing. So their excrement high in sugars, um, they produce this honeydew that will attract um, wasps and, and, you know, it's just like you're going out for a picnic and you open up a can of Mountain Dew who comes to visit yellow jackets, right? So that's what's going on in the landscape. Um, from a industry perspective for the nursery industry, it could take longer to develop saleable trees because at really high numbers, spotted lanternflies really stress the trees. And we are getting more and more information that shows us that uh, photosynthesis is reduced, uh, thereby the carbohydrate stores in the plant are reduced. 
the trees become more vulnerable to other stressors like pathogens um, and other insect pests and environmental effects. Um, <clears throat> so this is just not good for a tree. It just makes the, the stress of having thousands of insects feeding on it makes, it makes it really tough on the tree. And then we can go back to the honeydew story. The honeydew is a substrate for sooty mold. Um, so if you're in a tree that's filled with spotted lanternflies, and maybe some of you have experienced this where it's just raining honeydew, um, that's settling on the understory growth. And I guess if the understory growth is nothing but um, Japanese stilt grass, that would be good because it would all be covered with honeydew and sooty mold, which would block the photosynthesis and um, those plants would die. But generally in, in our wooded areas, that may not be the case. And this impact on understory development has a, could potentially have a significant ecological impact in certain areas. So um, does spotted lanternfly kill trees? Well, the only tree we, we know it, it can kill tree of heaven, that's been observed. Um, and black walnut sapling was observed to die from spotted lanternfly infestation. Um, it seems to be that if the pressure is high enough, the feeding pressure for the lanternfly, if that, if that feeding pressure is high enough, it does have quite a significant impact and particularly on say younger or smaller trees. So there's a, there was a study that was done this year. Hopefully we'll have uh, the analysis of that soon, but I don't like to say it's going to kill trees, um, but it, it may kill some trees that are more vulnerable than others. Let's, let's put it in those terms for right now. But generally we can look at this and say, what impacts spotted lanternfly um, population development and movement? Well, it's probably the weather, weather conditions, the impact of natural en enemies, and I'll talk about that later, as well as host plant availability um, and the health of the host plant. We can put two spotted lanternfly, two, sorry, two trees side by side. Doesn't matter which favorite tree it is, but I've seen this. You have one tree of heaven here and one tree of heaven here, and they both look like they're the same um, in terms of health and production. And spotted lanternflies might like one more than the others. So, um, uh, it seems to be they've been able to figure out which tree, which tree is easier for them to feed on because they're passive feeders. They're not, they're not really aggressive suckers. They're using the turgor pressure of the, uh, within the tree in order to push sap in, uh, into their mouth parts. So uh, let's talk about some natural enemies because we get this question all the time, like what likes to eat them? Well, we know that spiders like to eat them. We know that mantises like to eat spotted lanternflies. We know there's a number of predaceous <clears throat> uh, bugs in the landscape that will attack spotted lanternfly. And we also know that there are um, parasitoids in the environment that um, will attack spotted lanternflies as well. Are any of these things actually controlling the spotted lanternfly population? No, not, not at all. But I'm, I'm sure somewhere there's an impact. Everybody was excited to learn that Bavaria bassiana uh, was detected in spotted lanternfly populations. I'm hoping that this would be a solution to management and control of the spotted lanternfly. Still working on this particular topic. This is not going to be a silver bullet. It may be part of a spotted lanternfly management program in the future, um, but right now uh, still analyzing where using commercial uh, Bavaria products for spotted lanternfly control can, can work. So one of the big challenges in, in areas, excuse me, I'm still having allergy issues, but um, <clears throat> uh, one of the big problems that we saw a couple of years ago in areas that were really significantly infested with spotted lanternflies was they would see these trees, particularly red maple trees, and there would be some dieback in the crown 
things looked really bad. We knew they were loaded with spotted lanternfly. And first of all, everyone was blaming it on the lanternfly. Um, but you know, we really had to look at this further. If it wasn't the lanternfly, a lot of a lot of um, individuals were thinking this was verticillium wilt. It was not. Um, what we learned from this was that there were many factors in the landscape that contributed to stressed trees. And these stressed trees were then attacked by other um, ubiquitous pathogens in the landscape that were just able to take over. Spotted lanternfly was just one of those particular uh, stressors in the landscape. This, this tree is a parking lot tree. So first of all, it's already stressed because it's in a parking lot. Secondly, it wasn't planted correctly. Third, it's got girdling roots. It's got nowhere to go. It gets snow piled on it in the, in the wintertime, as well as salt. And it's got, poor tree has a whole lot of things against it. And then you throw spotted lanternfly on top of it. And it's really easy for some of these other pathogens um, uh, to attack the tree. So when we're discussing control and management uh, with anybody, um, I'm always trying to figure out what it is that the person on the other side of the phone is trying to accomplish. Um, mostly I've learned uh, that I'm just trying to manage expectations because spotted lanternfly cannot be totally eradicated from any one little small area. We cannot prevent spotted lanternfly from moving onto any specific property. So that's why I say this discussion about management and control is all based on expectations. Because of this, we developed this risk management chart. And beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Um, we're talking about what things have low risk and what things have a high risk. Low risk are this combination of few spotted lanternflies present and few of their favorite plants. So if you don't have many maples there, you don't have many birches, you don't have tree heaven, if you're loaded with conifers and you only have a few spotted lanternflies, that's really low risk because spotted lanternflies don't like conifers. They might sit on them, they might lay their eggs on conifers, uh, but they don't feed on them. So that's kind of the low risk end of this table. The high risk is where you have these thousands of insects feeding on one tree. So you've got heavy feeding, a lot of honeydew and sooty mold production. And these are vulnerable trees or plants like grapevines. So everything that we talk about with our callers is somewhere in the middle here. Um, for one person, maybe one spotted lanternfly is intolerable. And for another person, they don't really care. And they don't care what's growing, what plants are in their backyard either. So we have to walk people through this strategy of how are you, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? And what is the risk to the vegetation on your property? Or the property that you're trying to manage? And then we also walk them through all the different elements of control, cultural control, physical and mechanical control, biological control, um, and various types of chemical control. And explain that as you go up this ladder from cultural control to the more nuclear options of chemical control, generally the costs will increase as well as environmental impact. So, we develop this control management calendar based on what we would recommend for the public to do at certain times of the year. Um, and the most important thing is don't move spot and land or fly around. We just don't want it going from one spot to another. And we endorse everybody's um, assistance at not moving spotted lantern flies around. Um, but what I'm gonna focus on today are talking about these ovicides and various 
pesticides that are frequently used for um, spot and lanternfly control. Um, what about trapping? Um, trapping can work if, if you are trying to kill a lot of spotted lanternflies, trapping will work. The only good spotted lanternfly is a dead one and traps will collect and kill a lot of spotted lanternflies. People who are using sticky bands, however, we have cautioned them to please put some sort of barrier material on top of their sticky bands because sticky bands were really collecting more things than we wanted them to collect. And there was a, there was a significant outcry uh, regarding birds and squirrels and other small creatures getting stuck on sticky bands. So we've really reinforced the idea of if you're going to use a sticky band, put a barrier on top of it. But even better, use a circle trap, which is uh, on the right of, of your um, slot, your screen there. This is a modified version of a pecan weevil trap. And they're easy to make on your own and install on a tree. And yes, spotted lanternflies will crawl up the tree. And this is sort of like a flattened funnel on the side of a tree. And they will crawl up into there, in, into this funnel type area and get trapped in the plastic bag or, or other container that's attached to the top of the trap. So if you're trying to kill a lot of spotted lanternflies, traps will work, but this is not a control mechanism on its own. Ovicides, um, there is a, there's a challenge with using ovicides. Um, treating eggs with some sort of dormant rate of uh, horticultural spray oil. It's, it would be great if we could kill them in their egg stage, but mother nature designed, spotted, <laughs> designed eggs to be great survivalists. And it's not as easy as one would think. So here's what we've learned about using spray oils for spotted lanternfly control. Number one, most of the eggs that you see on a tree are beyond where we can reach by hand. Um, so they're up in the canopy of the tree, like over 90% of egg masses will be in the canopy of the tree. And so if you're trying to spray something up into the, that area of the tree, it's really hard to get complete coverage of egg masses um, using horticultural spray oils. And note that eggs are also laid on other materials that are not going to be treated. Uh, moreover, even at the highest labeled rate of application, um, more than a quarter of the egg mass is hatched. And also uh, another thing to consider is at the highest label rate of application, there are concerns about phytotoxicity for some of these plants. And it's also, may cost a lot more. Other insecticides that certainly have been looked at for the past four or five years are contact and foliar applications, as well as systemic applications to um, trees in the landscape. So we've done a lot of, I say we, the researchers and, and some of us in extension have helped with this looked at a lot of different types of foliar applications. Most of them we've learned have limited residual activity. There's always a lot of concerns about pesticide drift when we're out there um, spraying these trees. And in the broad spectrum of foliar applications, there are varying levels of toxicity to non-target organisms. The interesting thing about the spotted lanternfly is it's kind of, you know, it's, it's a fragile insect. You look at it cross-eyed and it dies, um, uh, but it's been very successful. Most of the products that we look at will kill it. Some, the efficacy will vary from the softer end of the pesticide spectrum. Efficacy is lower than going up to the, the other end of the pesticide spectrum which kills everything. So, and we always have to remind the public to uh, avoid plants when they're blooming. 
um, if they're going to use pesticides because the pollinators are out working the plants at the same time. So this is just a list of the various active ingredients that have been evaluated for um, spotted lanternfly control. And you can see that beta cyflutherin and bifenthrin are two of the products on here that have excellent residual activity. Everything else is kind of poor. You can go out there, use, use these products and kill a lot of spotted lanternflies, most of them. They will die today, but tomorrow more lanternflies will, will move in and the residuals are, are not going to give you much action after, after a day or so, unless you use one of these um, active ingredients, one of these synthetic pyrethroids with much better um, residual activity. We've also looked at systemic products uh, for use for spotted lanternfly um, treatments. Um, the two active ingredients looked at most closely are dinotefurin and aminocloprid. And these were applied by soil drenches, trunk sprays, or trunk injections. And depending on which active ingredient one is going to use, there is variable timing recommended. Dinotefurin is much more water soluble than aminocloprid, and therefore it moves through the plant a little bit quicker my guess is that's why its activity in spotted lanternfly is thus determined to be a little bit better than using aminocloprid. Uh, we remind people all the time that these systemic, systemic insecticides should be applied after bloom so that we don't worry about these neonicotinoids winding up in the, in the flowers where then pollinators would be exposed to those active ingredients that for which they're very sensitive to. Um, and, you know, the neonicotinoid issues are, you know, it's, it's, it's a constant sensitive issue about the, the impact of treating these trees and what's going to happen to the active ingredient, what the longstanding effect may be on po pollinators. And so this particular topic is still under investigation. Interestingly, um, when talking to the public, uh, oh, the public in general is really creative at coming up with alternative ways to treat for spotted lanternfly. Um, and all of these home remedies have been, yes, recommended to me. Um, I've got nothing against detergents, Dawn or anything else, but they're detergents. They're not insecticidal soaps. And um, they have other things in them that might actually really not be environmentally friendly. So Dawn dish detergent is not the solution to spotted lanternfly control. I've also had people recommend to me to spray everything um, with rubbing alcohol as well as kerosene. Um, and then there are some individuals that wanna burn them off. So I hope they don't do that after they've used kerosene all over their landscape. And I've also been told that WD-40 is the greatest thing for oversight control. None of these products are labeled as pesticides. And in fact, the use of um, these as pesticides may actually be, be illegal in some areas. And, and so um, we've, we've had to make a, a number of concerted um, efforts at uh, trying to keep the public from you know, pursuing the home remedy solution to spotted lanternfly control just doesn't work. It's not a good idea. There are better ways to kill a bug. And always the label's the law. We have to remind the public constantly that pesticides can only be applied exactly according to instructions. And anytime that people are not concerned about whether they're doing it right, we encourage them to call our offices uh, to ask and let us walk people through the process um, so they're, they're doing it the right way. We would rather take the time and walk someone through the right way than have people um, pollute the environment with pesticides that are, that are not used properly. So that's, that's, part of, that's part of the story 
And so that's, um, I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you very much. Um, and I can, we can open it up to questions because there's always a lot of questions about spotted lanternfly. And that's really, I'm, I'm here to answer your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. That was great, very informative. I learned a lot. And uh, I think if folks want to post questions in the chat, we will, uh, the staff will look in the chat for some questions. While people are doing that, I'll start. Early in the presentation, you mentioned yield loss at two, a couple of vineyards. The first one, I think, was 90% yield loss. The second one at a vineyard was 100%. Is there something that they could have done differently or should have done differently? Were they caught by surprise? What happened with those vineyards, or do we not know? So it, we, I don't know that we know the whole story yet. And this was back in 2017 and 2018. So I think the I think we can agree that there's a significant impact on vineyards. Um, I think part of the story is that um, spotted you know spotted lanternflies just sucking the life out of these grapevines really reduces their ability to survive the winter and thrive. And it could be that certain um, cultivars may be more um, uh, affected than others. So this is a whole area where we're still exploring and trying to figure out what's going on. But clearly, um, spot and lanternflies were having an impact on grapes. What could these growers have done differently? Um, probably not a whole lot. I mean, the second part of that slide was the fact that, you know, some growers, let's see, the cost increased from 50, about $55 per acre to um, $150 per acre because they increased their number of pesticide applications so many times. Um, and there's only so far they can go because just about the time when the vineyard wants to harvest their grape is when spotted lanternflies doing all that moving around. And so they can't spray because, you know, the labels restrict their use um, when it comes time to harvest. So I, I, there's not much they can do there. It's really up to us to figure out how, how to solve the problem for them. So I don't know that they could have done anything in that instance. What we've learned is that generally speaking, spotted lanternflies are gonna hang around the periphery of, um, of a vineyard rather than just you know, go through it. Uh, so maybe, they, maybe the, the grape growers will come up with a solution on how to attack the pest based on you know, how we have learned how it moves around in a vineyard. So I don't have an answer for them yet. Okay. There's a lot of I don't knows about spotted lantern. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you for that. But New York's concerned about that just as Pennsylvania. Y yeah. Are, uh, we're big grape growing states. <laughs> exactly. That's why I asked. Still yeah. more than well, that. But yeah, still, Long Island big, too. It's a big deal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a comment here from Amanda. Thank you for bringing up the dangers of using home remedies. I hear so often about home remedies, <clears throat> not just for spotted lanternfly, but for, for everything. weeds, for everything, uh, detergent, salt, vinegar. We're pouring stuff all over the soil out there, and uh, it's, it's not always the best thing to do. And Dan Gilroy, Dan Gilrain mentioned that there is a list of insecticides allowed for a lanternfly in New York, posted at the New York State IPM Spotted Lanternfly website. And that's right. in the chat. If people want to look at the link in the chat, they can and see your, that. What you can use in New York and what we use in Pennsylvania are two different things. It'll be different, exactly. Yeah. So folks can look that up. Just look at the chat. There's a link there. There's several thank yous for you. Here's a question. What is the best way to determine where to place the circle traps? in the spring? Are they best placed on trees that spotted lantern fly preferred in the previous season? 
that's what I would do. If, if you know that you have a tree that spotted lanternfly likes, um, and it has a history of liking that particular tree, that's, that's where I would put it. Um, or if one is trying to do surveillance for spotted lanternfly and you have tree of heaven in the area, you could put one on tree of heaven to see if they're going, if they're attracted to that tree. That's, that's a, um, that's the way that some people do surveillance. Um, but uh, this is what a number of people have done. If they know that there's a tree in their yard that spotted lanternflies have really liked and <coughs> they wanna either protect that tree or kill a lot of lanternflies, they will, they'll, they'll put the circle trap on that, that tree. All right. Do we know how these were introduced? Were they brought over on landscape rocks? Have you heard anything about that? So they were introduced via international commerce, uh, we think, either on um, the packaging material or on some or on some rocks. So I don't know that it's ever been determined exactly what the substrate was, but we know that they that is the story of how they were introduced. Do you know of any restrictions on the movement of landscape material? Any legal restrictions or recommendations? In Pennsylvania, um, about 34 of our um, counties are under quarantine. So there is a regulatory restriction about moving things around within the quarantine zone, as well as in and out of the quarantine zone. Um, and so that's how Pennsylvania is dealing with it. Other, if you go to the, the, um, the map that's from the IPM center there at Cornell, this, and you can find that at stopslf.org. They always have the updated map posted there, <clears throat> but not all states have quarantines in place. So for I can so I can only speak for how Pennsylvania is handling it. And in Pennsylvania, businesses that move materials around the state are required to have a spotted lanternfly permit. And all the permit is is, is buy-in from businesses that they know what spotted lanternfly is. They know how to find it on their materials that they're transporting throughout the state and that they will do what they can do to not be carrying it around. So that's how Pennsylvania deals with it. I think New Jersey um, may use may be using our permitting strategy as well. But I, I, I can only speak for um, uh, Pennsylvania. And yes, correct. Spotted lanternfly can be moved on many different things. Mm -hmm. If somebody has their um, their boat parked out in the back under a favorite tree where spotted lanternflies hang out, they can uh, lay their eggs on many different surfaces, on camping equipment, other things. So spotted lanternflies are just really good hitchhikers and can get moved around on so many different things. And that's part of what we're trying to teach the public, what to look for if you're trying to make sure you're not moved moving spotted lanternfly around, what do you want to look at? How do you, can you find the egg masses? Can you make sure that you're not moving them around from place to place? How does, one, Thank you. how does one obtain a spotted lanternfly circle trap? Can, can we buy them? Are there plans online to build one? Yeah, you can. Know? We have um, plans uh, at our website on how to build a circle trap. If one wishes to uh, make your own, um, there are also uh, commercially available products. You just Google pecan weevil circle trap um, and one can order one, but probably just as easy to make your own. All right. So visit us on our website for okay. auto lanternfly circle trap. All right. The New York State Ag and Markets has been recommending to place traps on Tree of Heaven or other trees next to other prime hosts, such as wild grape. And ag specialists have increased targeting of stone shipments. 
from mm -hmm. spotted lanternfly host locations. That's from Tom Algaier at Agon Markets. Thanks, Tom. Let's see, comment from Dan Gilrain at Cooperative Extension. Spotted lanternfly can be moved on more than just landscape materials, uh, rusty metal, wood, other objects, vehicles, inside vehicles, and cargo holds. Firewood. They like, yeah. they remind people all the time, firewood, you, you buy it where you're going to burn it. Don't move it around. Mm -hmm. Many parallels between spotted lanternfly and gypsy moth in terms okay. of carrying it around. Yeah, I guess be careful moving things, not mm -hmm. just for spotted lanternfly, but for other invasives as well. Correct. Tom Algayer mentioned a stone carved bench. Tom, was that how it was thought to move? I'm not sure. We've well, seen it, it's, it was more than just a, sorry to jump in. It was more yeah, than okay. the landscape stone. When you say landscape stone, you think, you know, small pieces of gravel or like pavers, but it, it was, um, you know, it, it's more than that. It was, you know, carved benches, statuary type thing. Okay. Um, it, it wasn't just like, you know, pea gravel that it came in on. Um, and as Dan mentioned, any, any, any flat surface surface exposed to the environment is a prime host. So it, it's really not a stone issue. Um, it was just a, a non-moving object that was exposed to the environment. You know, any, any flat surface is fair game, just like gypsy moth. And we have even seen patio furniture covered with egg masses. And we would always say hard flat surfaces, well, those cushions weren't hard, but they were still covered with spotted lanternfly egg masses. Yeah, I like to say, don't leave grandma sitting outside too long because, you know, the legs on grandma <laughs> it doesn't move enough. Yeah, any, anything non-moving and flat, that's... Just... <laughs> All right, thanks, Tom. Yeah, that uh, patio furniture, getting that messed up will definitely get Long Islanders' attention. And uh, what is the website? What is your website? You may have given it before in the presentation, but where can people see more of your work and you have a couple of articles online too that i that we had seen that were very good also yeah i can put the website in the excuse me chat <coughs> I'll, I'll put it here The, uh, the traps, is there bait in the circle traps or do they just physically no. crawl up into it? They just physically crawl up into just it. That takes no advantage of their tendency to crawl up, crawl up things. Right. And uh, we, we know of no pheromone or any type of bait that will attract them hmm. thus far. Any other questions? Does anybody have questions? <coughs> Abby and Haley, do you have any other questions? Well, if anyone has any questions later on or um, uh, something comes to mind, uh, you can always reach out to me. I'm easy to find at, at uh, Penn State. Corman with a K, not a C. <laughs> All right. So thanks very much for having right. me today. Thank you very much. That was great, very informative. I learned a lot, I'm sure everyone did as well. All right, so thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your, oh, enjoy your weekend and enjoy the holidays. Thanks, you too. All right, it is 11.50. Our next presentation is at 12. We could take a 10 minute break if you'd like and then come back and we'll start right at 12. How about we do that? Let's, uh, let's come back at, at noon, but we'll start promptly at noon because we have some time to get ready and be prepared. All right, see you in a bit.